Chapter 36 Arrest at the Quidditch World Cup Salazar sighed, pinched the bridge of his nose, and glared at the six people who were currently staring at him with giant puppy dog eyes and pleading faces. He stared at the ceiling of Merlin's small cottage, and shook his head in defeat. Fine, he said with exasperation, and those six people erupted with loud shouts of joy. But only if you agree to my stipulations. He cried loudly as he was engulfed by several people giving him hugs. Anything Uncle Salazar? Harry cried as the boy grinned up at him. Just as long as I get to go. He had been arguing all morning with Lily, James, Harry, Gordrick, Sirius, and Remus on whether or not the Potters should risk going to the Quidditch World Cup that was going to be held in several weeks. All of the Weasleys were going, sans Molly, because Arthur had procured several tickets that would place them right in the minister's box, which were said to be the very best seats in the stadium. Hermione was going to be with Salazar and the others in their box, while Blaze and Neville would be sitting in the box right next to the ministers, because Blaze's mother had secured three tickets of her own for the World Cup. Salazar had been completely against the Potters going, and had argued all morning about all the possible dangers that could befall them while there. Everything from someone slipping up and calling them the wrong name, to possible Death Eaters that could be at the World Cup. He had been out-argued on everything, and Gordrick was right in the middle of it, egging them all on. As Merlin, Nicholas, and Perino chuckled in the background, Gordrick laughed and grinned at the potters. I told you I would get him to crack. I hate you. Salazar responded with a withering sigh. You'll live Salazar. Gordrick chuckled. It's not me that I'm worried about living, it's them. Salazar cried, motioning towards the potters. Well, what are your stipulations, and we will do all that you suggest, James said with a happy grin. Salazar glared at him, but then he sighed again. First, you polyjuice yourselves to look like random mulls off the street. On top of that, you will all wear Port Necklace's key to bring you here. It will activate with the phrase emergency, and of course, you will go by different names. We could use the names Mary, John, and Jimmy Olsen. Lily offered. No. Salazar said shaking his head. That's what you go by in your current location. We need to think up a different name. Lily sighed and scrunched up her face in thought. All right, well what about using placeholder names? She asked. What's that? Salazar asked curiously. They're common names Mulls use for people who are unknown forgotten, or irrelevant. In the US they use John and Jane Doe for adults and Johnny and Janie Doe for children. In the U.K. they use the last name blogs. She answered. I like the last name Doe. Harry said with a nod. It reminds me of your patronus mum. No, 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 no. Salazar shouted, waving his arms around. I don't want anything that could remotely tie you all to being the potters. Gordrick burst out laughing. Salazar, your paranoia is showing. Shut up Gordrick. Salazar grumbled, causing everyone to laugh. Hey I have a name. Harry cried, snapping his fingers. Remember at my twelfth birthday party when you used the name Cliff Danielson? I could be Cliff Danielson, Dad could be Dot Oh I don't know Dot Radcliffe Danielson and mum could be Emma Danielson. Radcliffe! Sirius shouted as he burst out laughing. James is rad. Rad I tell you. Radical! James cried. I'm a Radcliffe. Lily rolled her eyes at her husband and his best friend. I swear, you two are barmy. Well, I like the names, and there is no way anyone can possibly trace the name Radcliffe Danielson and his family to the likes of Harry Potter. Salazar said with a firm nod. However, I do want to press upon you the seriousness of the situation. If there is any sign of trouble, you use the porks. Don't worry about anyone else. You just get to safety. We understand Salazar. Lily said with a sincere nod. If something should happen, we will get out first thing. 
I know I'm not the usual type to say run at the first sign of danger, but in, in this case I say good. Gordrook said with a nod. I don't want to lose my grandson and his family. I'm not going anywhere grandpa. Harry said with a grin. I promise. See that you don't. Gordrook said with a grin as he ruffled the boy's hair. It's true that you're not going anywhere, except to wash up so that you can eat your dinner. Lily said, shooing her son towards the bathroom. I know you've been running around outside and throwing a ball for Padfoot to catch. Now, go wash up. Mum. Harry mockingly whined as he grinned. I'm not a baby anymore. I'm fourteen. You'll always be my baby, now shoo. Lily cried, causing Harry to groan and everyone else to chuckle. As Salazar watched the lad hurry out the room, he sincerely hoped that he hadn't made a terrible mistake. As the Quidditch World Cup drew closer, Salazar became more and more agitated. He began to think up all kinds of security checks and started to plan who would sit where in the minister's box, as well as what to do should trouble arise. They were, after all, going to be in a very large public place. And to say that Salazar was paranoid over that, was an understatement. He had already operated into London and nicked the hairs off a completely oblivious Mull family sitting at a table in an outdoor cafe. He also went and bought a few sets of Mull clothes, seeing as the dress code for the Quidditch World Cup was to dress like one, and he kept a close eye on everything having anything to do with the event. He also knew of all of the security measures the Ministry had put in place, thanks to Arthur. When the day arrived for them to go, Salazar, Gordrick, Lily, James, Sirius, Remus, and Harry all decided to gather at Salazar's flat and apparat to the designated apparition spots that surrounded the stadium, using side along apparition for Salazar and Harry. Hermione, Neville, Blaze, and Blaze's mum were meeting up at the Weasleys, and they would all be travelling in by Portk. They had overnight campsites where they would be setting up their tents, and thankfully they were only a few spots away from the Weasleys, much to Fred and George's delight. Salazar had decided to go as Harry, and used his polyjuice rock from the year before because Nicholas hadn't made the current one for the upcoming year yet. This, he thought, would work better than him going in his adult form, and he would use himself as a decoy should anyone get suspicious. Not to mention, it would be easier to explain why he was speaking parcel tongue, seeing as Nora insisted on coming. It was early in the morning when they arrived at the stadium, and Salazar scanned the crowd for anything suspicious as they made their way towards the campsite. He knew he was on edge and he glared at Gordrick, who was using his stone to look like Gordy, every time he said lighten up. After they reached their campsites and set up their tents, Salazar breathed a small sigh of relief as everyone began to settle in. Blaze, Neville, and Blaze's mum were sharing a tent a few spots away. Cordric, Salazar, Sirius, Remus, Harry, Lily, and James were in their very large tent, and Hermione was bunking with Ginny in the Weasley's tent. Arthur, Fred, George, Percy, Hermione, Blaze, and Neville knew exactly who the newcomers were, but they were introduced to everyone else as friends of Gordy's family. Everyone not in the know accepted it without a fuss, and Salazar silently cheered seeing as that part of the plan had worked really well. He tensed up again though, when the children decided they wanted to go off exploring. Harry of course wanted to go with them, so James and Lily decided to go too. The children wanted to see if they could spot fellow classmates and also to buy trinkets and souvenirs from the multitude of vendors milling about the campsite areas. Cordrick, Sirius, and Remus went with them but Salazar stayed behind to watch over their tent. He didn't know if he would be able to stop himself from hexing anyone who dared to accidentally bump into one of the potters. It was during this nerve-wracking time that a grinning Percy wandered over towards him, and he smiled at the lad as he approached. I just wanted to let you know that I got a job at the ministry. Percy exclaimed, sitting next to Salazar in the shade of the tent. I'm now working in the Department of International Magical Corporation. Percy, that is really great, and I am so proud of you for being able to achieve your dream. 
your newt scores were fantastic. He replied, giving the young wizard a sincere grin. Thanks Harry. It feels good to moving on to the next stage of my life. Mum is proud of me, Dad is proud of me, and I hope to be an inspiration to Fred and George, but they only seem interested in pranks. Especially now. He said with a knowing chuckle. Well, there is nothing wrong with pranks and jokes. There truly isn't. Salazar said with a chuckle. Take Zonkos for instance, if not for their love of pranks and jokes they wouldn't be successful. You wanted to follow your dream, and you have. Fred and George have their dreams too, it's just that there's a different. It would be an awfully boring world if we all did the same thing. Percy furrowed his brow for a moment, but then he nodded slowly. I suppose if you put it like that, I understand what you mean. Perhaps you are right. I just wish they would do a lot better in school. I do agree on that one. I think Fred told me that they got barely six OWLs between them. Don't worry though, I scolded them, Salazar said with a grin. So did Mum. Percy laughed, but then he grinned too. Hey there's my boss Mr. Crouch. He's talking to Dad and Ludho Bagman. He said, as he stood up. Maybe they are talking about what's going to happen this year at Hogwarts, so I better go. Salazar chuckled. I know all about the tournament, but don't worry, we haven't said a word about it to the children. You take care though, and if you need anything, just let me know. I will Harry, thank you. Percy said as he took a deep breath, and hurried over to his father and Crouch. Salazar smiled as he watched the lad go but his calculating gaze kept sweeping the crowds for anything out of the ordinary. It was much later when everyone returned for lunch. Lily had made sure they took a swig of their polyjuice potions, which eased Salazar's mind, but Hermione appeared to be slightly angry about something. When lunch was served by Peaky and Dobby, Salazar asked her what was wrong. Hermione let out a long sigh and shook her head. It's Ginny. She keeps asking all kinds of personal questions about you. It's getting rather annoying actually. Fred groaned and shook his head. She still hasn't grown out of her crush on you Harry. She asks us all the time about you. She even asked me if I was your girlfriend. I told her no of course, but all she wants to do is talk about Harry Potter. Hermione said, sounding slightly embarrassed at that. I don't mean any harm, but I don't date children, Salazar said firmly. I know your sister has had a crush on me since the very first time I saw her, but I'm not interested. She wants to date the boy who lived, George said, rolling his eyes. Lily scoffed. Only over my dead body would I let someone date or marry my son just because of his fame. Rightly said Mum. Harry said. She's pretty but I couldn't date her. No offense guys. He added, sheepishly glancing over at the twins. None taken Cliff. Fred said with a wink, but then he grinned at Salazar. You don't date children, but would you date someone like Dot McGonagall, for instance? Gordrick burst out laughing. Yes, so don't let him lie to you. Harry, Neville, and Blaze looked slightly green and started to sway in their seats. No one wants to talk about old people's love lives. Harry shouted, causing Sirius, James, and Remus to burst out laughing. Yeah, people are trying to eat here. Neville added. <laughs> Speaker, and Kitty. A nice combination. Nora said, looking up from the table where she had been napping. Don't start my dear. Salazar warned. Or I will leave you here. You wouldn't dare or I will bite you in your sleep dot again. She threatened with a soft hiss, causing the others to grin and giggle. You and McGonagall? George laughed. That would be something to see. Salazar grinned at the lad, and hit him with a stinging jinx, but in that same moment a trumpet sounded all throughout the area. Arthur, along with Percy, Ron, Ginny, and Blaze's mum, came rushing in a few moments later. Here we go. Arthur said with excitement while rubbing his hands together. Shall we head up to our seats? 
The rest of lunch was abandoned immediately as everyone stampeded towards the tent door. No sooner had Salazar gotten everyone situated according to the prearranged seating plan he came up with, than his entire body stiffened on instinct. Harry, who was seated right next to him, looked at Salazar curiously, but all questions were answered as soon as the problem spoke. Well, well if it isn't Scarhead and Rotten. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant Potter and Roffin. Draco smirked, as he and his family settled themselves into a few seats away from them. I'm surprised you all could afford. Draco was instantly cut off when Lucius jabbed the end of his cane in his son's chest. Draco let out a slight ho of sound, but quickly shut up. Not here Draco. Remember your manners. Narcissa said, looking straight forward and trying to ignore the presence of those beneath her. Serious don't, serious don't. Lily hissed, but she was ignored. Funny you should mention anything about affording things Draco, seeing as the Malfoys can't afford anything more a goat pen. Sirius said in a deadly tone, as he turned and glared at them. Hello Narcissa. Cousin Sirius. She acknowledged with a semi-polite nod, as Lucius glared at him. Nothing more was said though, as the minister's box slowly began to fill. As Salazar watched everything with a sharp eye, Nora broke into his thoughts with a loud hiss. Speaker, I don't like the way the clown is glaring at your back. It's as if he is trying to set you on fire. Perhaps I should wrap myself around the railing in front of us, so that I can keep a better watch on your back. I shall bite him if he flinches. An excellent suggestion my dear. The more eyes we have on them, the better. Salazar said, as he unwrapped her from around his arm and laid her on the railing in front of them. The minister's box suddenly became still and quiet as everyone stopped talking to glance in their direction. Fudge, who looked positively ashen at hearing Parcel Tong, stared at Salazar nervously. Ah, Mr. Harry Potter. I had heard rumors you were a parcel mouth, but it's a pleasure to have the savior of the wizarding world among us today. Fudge said, nervously shaking Salazar's hand. Minister, it's nice to see you again. How is the head hunting coming along? Salazar asked with a chuckle, which caused Remus to snort. Fudge looked slightly taken back, but he relaxed and chuckled as he caught on. Very well I'm pleased to say. Though that nasty business with Peter Pettigrew is still being worked on. I'm afraid to say there's been no headway. Not surprised the rat got away. It's what he's best at. Sirius growled. We will find him, rest assured. Fudge said with a nod. Speaker, there is something suspicious I see. Nora suddenly yelled from her position on the rail she was wrapped around. Salazar turned sharply with his wand in his hand. Where my dear? That scared looking elf has someone invisible sitting next to her. I see his heat signature. He's under some sort of Axio invisibility cloak. Hermione suddenly shouted, cutting Nora off. Everyone stared in shock as the cloak flew into her outstretched hand. In the next moment, chaos erupted in the minister's box as several people screamed, Barty Crouch Jr., and began trying to scramble out of the way. The thin blondish-haired man sat frozen in shock with wide eyes, as the elf sitting beside him began wailing loudly. He suddenly snapped out of his stupor and began trying to run, but an unseen stunning spell from Godrook saw the man crumple to the ground. Fudge began barking orders at nearby Rez, while the Malfoys looked around in shock and retreated to the far corner of the box. Arthur began shielding his children and Hermione, as Remus and Sirius began shuffling the Potters out of danger, but it was Neville who shocked everyone even more. The lad leapt over the railing that separated the two boxes and began shouting, hexing, punching, and kicking the still unconscious Crouch. You bleeding bloody death eater. You helped torture my parents. Why are you not in Azkaban where you belong? Neville bellowed. Neville. Neville stop. Hermione cried, banging her hand on the rail in order to get his attention, but Neville wasn't paying attention to her. A blast from Sirius's wand, 
and a tackle to the ground from Gordrick brought Neville somewhat back to his senses. Errors began filing into the box and they quickly apprehended the still unconscious, and severely bleeding wizard. However, Gordrick was still trying to restrain a struggling Neville as he continued to shout. That's only part of what I'll do if I ever get my hands on Bellatrix less strange. So you better hope I never set eyes on that psychotic witch who kissed the ass of that half-blooded son of a mole. I'm more pure-blooded than Voldemort will ever be. Neville collapsed against Gordrick, and it was all Gordrick could do but hold the boy up until he got him seated. Neville began shaking as he clenched and unclenched his fists. Peaky. Master called for Peaky? The elf asked, glancing around at everyone. Get a calming draft from anywhere you can. Gord recorded, and Peaky popped away immediately. Peaky operated in a few moments later with the calming draft and Gordrick practically had to force feed it to Neville, who instantly became a little calmer. He sat the breathing heavily for a few moments, but then he looked up at everyone. I apostrophe M. I am so sorry. I I don't know. I just saw him and. I I. Neville, I think you have been hanging out with way too many Gryffindors, Blaze said, trying to ease the tension in the box. Neville snorted and let out a large breath he had been holding. But I am a Gryffindor. I know, but Harry, Cordy, and I have been secretly trying to turn you into a Slytherin, Blaze teased. Everyone chuckled at that, but Fudge looked around at everyone. Young man, what is your name? He asked sternly. Neville sir. He answered, standing up and looking at the minister apologetically. Neville Longbottom. I'm a Hogwarts student going into fourth year. Longbottom, Fudge whispered loudly, as recognition dawned on the man. Very well, under the circumstances Mr. Longbottom, seeing as the man we just apprehended was partly responsible for. Well you certainly understand. I will let you off with a warning about underage magic. We have him now and we will get answers. He said firmly. Then he turned to Hermione. And you young lady. Who are you and how did you know that Crouch Jr. was there? My name is Hermione Granger sir, fourth year Gryffindor, and it was Nora who saw him. She replied, pointing to Nora who was still wrapped around the railing. Nora said she spotted someone suspicious sitting next to the elf that was there, and mentioned that she saw the heat signature of the man. She said he was invisible, and I cast the reversal spell for the disillusionment charm but that didn't work so I summoned the cloak, she answered, handing the cloak to a nearby Ra who was taking down notes. Fudge stared at her in disbelief. You speak Parseltong? he asked, glancing from Salazar, to Nora, then back to Hermione. Oh no sir, she said, shaking her head. But I can understand it. Harry taught myself, Fred, George, Neville, and Blaze how to understand it back when we were in first year, I see, Fudge said, glancing at everyone. Professor Dumbledore is the one who sort of gave us the idea minister, Fred said. He can understand Parcel Tong as well. We asked him if it was hard to learn and he said it was, but we were determined to learn it so Harry taught us. Oh yes, yes, I'm aware of Dumbledore being able to understand Parcel Tong, Fudge said suddenly coming back to his senses. Dumbledore is a very good man. Very well then. Miss Granger, I commend you on your quick thinking and actions, and I will also let you off with a warning about underage magic. As for Nora, he said, turning towards her with a nervous smile. If you can understand me, I thank you. Because of you, we have apprehended a dangerous man. Salazar chuckled as Nora raised her head up proudly and slithered over to him, causing Fudge to take a small step backwards. You're very welcome Mr. Important Person. I do what I can. She says you're welcome. Fred, George, Neville, Hermione, Blaze, and Salazar said at the same time, then they burst out laughing. Fudge nodded and smiled nervously, but then he glanced at Vera. Do you have everything? We still don't know who stunned Crouch Jr. Minister. Vera replied, checking over his notes. Oh, 
Ah, that was me. Gordruk said, raising his hand. You did? Fudge asked in disbelief. Well I didn't even see the spell. The Ur and everyone else looked at Gordruk in stunned disbelief. How old are you Mr. Ruffin, Gordy Ruffin sir. I'm a third year Slytherin. Gordruk replied. Blimey, a child that can cast spells that are silent and invisible. A mark of a duelist. The Ur commented, scribbling that information down. A warning for this lad as well minister? Oh yes, yes. Fudge said, staring at Gordruk who just shrugged. I think we got all we need now. Vera said, rolling up the parchment. I'll get this to Madam Bones, and we will find out how Crouch escaped Azkaban. He said, eyeing Sirius suspiciously. Hey don't look at me. Sirius said, throwing up his hands. Crouch supposedly died a week after his parents visited him. I know this because he was in the cell next to mine. I would talk to Barty Sr. if I were you. Yes, find Barty immediately. I know that elf belonged to him, so get this mess straightened out. Fudge snapped, suddenly growing angry. If I find out he had anything to do this. His voice trailed off as he crushed the hat he was holding. We have a Quidditch World Cup to be getting on with. Someone find Ludo Bagman and get him up here so we can start the match. He's probably still taking bets on who will win Minister. Vera said rolling his eyes. But we will find him. He added, before hurrying out of the box and down the stairs. The occupants of the box somewhat regained their composure and began retaking their seats. However, Fudge looked over at Neville, who was back in his seat in the next box over, and spoke. Mr. Longbottom, if I may? What was that bit about you know who being half-blooded? He asked curiously. Neville looked at him apologetically and he flushed with embarrassment. It's true sir. Voldemort's real name is Tom Riddle. His father was a mole. How do you know that? Fudge gasped, as he stared at Neville in disbelief. Salazar cast a smirk in the Malfoy's direction as they stared at Neville in shock and disgust, but he spoke up. Professor Dumbledore will have most of the answers to your questions Minister, Salazar said, still not taking his eyes off the Malfoys. But we can tell you that we found an old diary of Voldemort's at Hogwarts last year. It had a lot of information about him in it. Voldemort's full name is Tom Marvolo Riddle. If you are familiar with anagrams, the letters of his name can be arranged into a sentence that says I am Lord Voldemort. That wasn't the entire truth though, seeing as Neville and Hermione were the first know it. Riddle had taken great pleasure in spouting off several useful facts before Salazar and the others had arrived in the chamber. Salazar smirked as Lucia sculpted slightly, but he continued. We learned a lot about Voldemort from the diary actually. Neville was right, he is more pure than that half-blooded son of a mull that fancies himself a lord. I find it amusing that my own blood is also purer than Voldemort's blood. At least both my parents were magical. Sirius burst out laughing. Oh Harry, if James had heard that, he would laugh so hard. James was indeed trying not to laugh, or draw attention to himself, but Lily sat there with a proud smirk on her face as she faced forward in her seat and stared out over the pitch. Well Mr. Potter, Fudge said with an air of authority. I will certainly be asking Dumbledore about that. Do you know where this dairy of you know who came from? Salazar took his eyes off Lucius long enough to glance at the minister. I don't know sir, but Dumbledore does, and he also knows just who is responsible for the diary making its way into the school. He added. Very well then. I'll make it a point to speak with Dumbledore about that. Fudge said, but then his eyes lit up. Ah! Bagman at last. I think it's time we start the match old boy. Indeed Cornelius. A grinning, portly man dressed in an old Quidditch uniform said, as he bounded into the minister's box. With everyone distracted, Salazar glanced back at Lucius, who was glaring at him, and smirked. 
Lucius's eyes narrowed but Salazar took great pleasure in mouthing the word you, and watched with glee as Lucius paled drastically. The match lasted for several, several hours, but in the end, Salazar was happy to note that Bulgaria caught the snitch, even if Ireland won. Everyone was in their tent, and Salazar founding it amusing as Gordrick and Ron babbled on about Victor Grum and his amazing and brilliant flying methods, but seeing Ron joking and laughing with everyone made him smile. However, Ginny kept casting glances at Salazar and seemed to try and follow him around everywhere he went. He made it a point to stick close to everyone and not go off alone. Everyone was in a celebratory mood though. Singing, dancing, laughter, and conversations flowed throughout the tent as the sounds of partying echoed around them from people in other tents. Harry, James, and Lily were smiling brighter than Salazar had seen them do in a long time, and he was pleased to see how easy Harry seemed to fit in with all the children. They were quickly all becoming very good friends. It was 3 a.m. when the adults finally ushered the children off to bed in their respective tents. There was a lot of loud complaining, but everyone was getting rather sleepy. Salazar laughed as Harry protested, and said he wanted to sleep in the Weasley tent, and argued that he'd sleep on the floor next to the twins' beds if he had to, so Lily finally relented and made him take another swig of polyjuice potion before going to help him get settled in. When she came back, she found Salazar sitting at the table in the quiet tent, sipping coffee, and reading a book. You're not going to bed? she asked, sitting down beside him. He shook his head and smiled at her. I'll sleep tomorrow when I'm back at home and you are all safe in Rio, he whispered. It has been stressful for you with us being here, she said, looking at him sadly. I'm sorry. Don't be. Salazar assured her as he patted her hand. It has been stressful, I admit, but it has been worth it. Seeing you all do something normal for a change has been wonderful, and it gave Harry more time to get to know everyone else. It has been fun. I don't think we have had this much fun in years, she said with a smile. Thank you Salazar. I know, and you're welcome Lily, he said with a chuckle. You head to bed though, it's been a long day. It has, she agreed as she tried to stifle a yawn. But what do you think about Crouch? Why was he here and what was he planning to do? I don't know. He said shaking his head. I knew he was a Death Eater, but I didn't know what happened to him until I read backdated issues of the Daily Prophet. Crouch was sent to as Coburn for his part in Frank and Alice's torture. The paper said he died, like Sirius said, but I don't know much more than that. I'm sure it will be in the paper tomorrow, or the next day. Lily said with a tired nod. Or a version of it anyway. Salazar chuckled. True. She said with a smile. All right. I'm headed to bed. I'll see you in the morning. Good night Lily. He watched as she shuffled off to bed and smiled as he caught sight of the first hints of her red hair beginning to show itself. Barty Crouch Sr. arrested for helping Death Eater Son escape Azkaban. By Rita Skeeter. Just before the start of the Quidditch World Cup yesterday, there was a disturbance in the minister's box as Harry Potter, the boy who lived, and his friends helped take down the dangerous Azkaban escapee, Barty Crouch Jr. Details are a bit fuzzy but it is said that Harry Potter's pet snake saw someone suspicious sitting in the minister's box, and that Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, and Neville Longbottom heard the snake mention that something was amiss. Potter, a parcel mouth Slytherin going into his fourth year, and his two friends, who understand parcel tongue, immediately sprang into action. They defended Cornelius Fudge in what could have been a well-thought-out assassination plot against the minister's life. Hermione Granger, a studious Gryffindor going into her fourth year, summoned the invisibility cloak Crouch Jr. was hiding under, thereby exposing him for all to see. Harry Potter leapt in front of Minister Fudge in order to defend him, and stunned Barty Crouch Jr. before the Death Eater could even draw his wand. In an odd twist, Neville Longbottom recognized the wizard for his part in his parents' torture, 
and the young brave Gryffindor hexed the Death Eater six ways from Sunday while shouting at him. Arrows were instantly on the scene, and they quickly apprehended Barty Crouch Jr., and arrested his father, Barty Crouch Sr., just a few hours later. During the aftermath, Harry Potter said some very interesting things about you-know-who, while speaking to a very shaken and disturbed minister. Mr. Potter claims to know about an old-school diary that belonged to you-know-who. Mr. Potter said that the old diary revealed that you-know-who's real name is Tom Marvolo Riddle, and that an anagram can be made of the name. An anagram that ominously says, I am Lord. You know who. Using other information found in this mysterious diary, Mr. Potter also claims that you know who is in fact. A half blood. Mr. Potter is quoted as saying, Neville was right. In what he said while shouting at Crouch Jr., he, Mr. Longbottom, is more pure blooded than that half blooded son of a mull that fancies himself a lord. I find it amusing that my own blood is also purer than Voldemort's blood. At least both my parents were magical. Could it be true? Is you know who a half blood? Born from a common mole? Me, myself, and I want to know, as do you, my wonderful readers. I promise to get to the bottom of this and see what other juicy details I can dig up. Until next time. Rita Skeeter. For details involving Barty Crouch Sr.'s involvement in his son's escape from Azkaban. See page 3. It wasn't me that stunned Crouch, it was Godric. Salazar shouted, after reading the paper Merlin handed to him when they returned to Ireland the next morning. I was too busy trying to wrap my head around what was happening. And just what is that woman trying to do? Paint a target on my son's back? Lily cried. Okay not my son dot but you all get the point. I already have a target painted on my back, so it's okay Lily. Don't worry. Salazar said, shaking his head. An assassination plot? What is that rubbish? Gordrick asked. No one seemed to know, and just glared at the paper now sitting at the table. The article on page 3 goes on to describe how Crouch Sr. carried out his dying wife's last request and broke his son out of Azkaban using polyjuice potion, and switched his wife for his son. Merlin said, motioning towards the paper. However, they are denying that it was an assassination attempt on the minister's life. They claim Junior was just there to watch the match, and that the elf was supposed to be watching him. Crouch Senior is going to Azkaban for not only breaking his son out of prison, but also using the imperious curse on his son in order to control him and keep him inside the house at all times. This apparently has been going on for many, many years. Well that is their problem, not ours. A red, bleary-eyed, and very exhausted Salazar said as he stood up. And with that, I'm going home to get some sleep. I trust you all to get home safely from here. He added with a smile as he gave the Potters goodbye hugs. Uncle Salazar, I hope you have a good day's rest, and I hope to see you at Christmas. Harry said, throwing his arms around the old wizard. We love you. Now go home and get some sleep. Salazar chuckled as he pulled Harry close. I love you too Harry, and I'll hopefully see you all soon. After another round of goodbyes, Salazar operated to his flat in Diagon Alley and slipped into his bed for some much needed rest. Hello everyone, I am Matt1995 here with a small announcement for the video game fanfic plot. I know in... Every ending of videos, there is a small announcement that I will take request any fanfic or video game. That will stop right now. I have too much videos that I need to complete. There's sequels that need to be put up. I am sorry for any requests that people suggested will be put on the back burner until I completed my videos. I even made a list of videos that needed to be completed. I am so sorry about that. Until next time, I am Nat1995, signing off.